Hello everyone, welcome to day three of the 12 days of Yule challenge. Today's prompt is to reflect on the last year of your magical practice. And this is one of the videos that I am most excited for for this challenge because as a chaos magician myself, I go through a process of what's called paradigm jumping, which is where I really shift my framework, shift my perspective and bounce around to a lot of different magical traditions. And there's many different goals and reasons why one should paradigm jump. And I'm not gonna go into that. You can watch my chaos magic videos if you want. But really the goal for me is to find the most effective streamlined magical practice as possible. And there's also this whole process of ego deconstruction where I'm going through my mind to see if there's any brainwashing or societal conditioning that maybe doesn't serve me. And I'm working to break down those structures and to really free myself from limitations. So I have done a lot of deconstructing <laughs> this past year. I have definitely shifted my perspective many, many times. I've tried many different things and I'm kind of excited to just sit down and share all that with you. This video is gonna be based heavily on my own personal gnosis. So if that is not your stuff, Style, this video is not going to be for you. I personally enjoy hearing other people's personal gnosis because I feel like I've met, I think I've mentioned this before, but if you're not sharing personal gnosis, you're not saying anything new. If we're not sharing our own personal experiences, we're just basically regurgitating the same exact ideas or experiences from these classic occult books and not really adding anything to the conversation. So I quite enjoy listening to other people's personal gnosis. As with everything, take what resonates, leave what doesn't. So I wanna go all the way back to January of this year and I'm gonna have this video broken down into uh, topics. So I'm gonna discuss vampiric magic, that is something I I did a heavy deep dive into this year. I want to discuss the deity work, the two deities that I've been working with this year, and a couple other things. So feel free to, if there's a subject that doesn't really interest you, feel free to skip and move on to the next one. The first topic I want to talk about is chaos magic itself, because at the beginning of this year, January 3rd to be exact, you know what's great about being a YouTuber? So that I can actually go back to the videos I posted over this last year and see exactly where my mind was at. Before doing YouTube, I would have a pretty heavy journaling process. That way I could keep track of where I was throughout the year, all the things that I was reading and learning, any new insights or perspective shifts, I would know all of that in a journal. I definitely recommend doing that. It's so helpful to see your growth and to assess where you currently are and see if it's working for you. But anyways, so January 3rd, I had posted a video to Chaos Magicians Debate Chaos Magic Philosophies, and that was with Sanrei. He is one of my really good friends. We are both Chaos Magicians, and it's so funny because I don't find that Chaos Magicians typically agree on a lot of things, and that's the point. The point is is to do what works and whatever works for you may be different for someone else. So we had this um, debate talking about chaos magic philosophies and for a belief in magic or a system of magic, I found that I was too dogmatic. After having that conversation with Sanrei, it really kind of shifted my perspective on chaos magic itself. And this probably deserves to be its whole separate video. Honestly, it is something that I'm currently writing about. But for a magical system that somewhat rejects dogma, although some chaos magicians would disagree and say that it doesn't necessarily reject dogma. Some people say, yes, rejecting dogma is a very integral part of chaos magic. But regardless, for a system that really doesn't like dogma, let's just say that, I found that I was still being way too dogmatic. There was a lot more ego deconstruction that I needed to do around what is chaos magic and who can define themselves as a chaos magician. Really, I don't give a shit about labels. I don't care. People can call themselves whatever they want to. My personal perspective was, if you aren't working to do the ego deconstruction, to really assess the, the limitations and the conditioning that you have set in your mind and really try to push past that, then you're not doing chaos magic. And that in itself is a very dogmatic way to view chaos magic. Do I think that that makes you a more effective practitioner? Absolutely. But do I now think that that's an integral part of chaos magic? I'm not so sure because I don't think that we can put labels or rules onto what chaos magic is if it's a system that totally rejects rules and limitations. It's kind of like a paradox in itself, you know? It's really difficult to define because chaos magic does not want to be defined. So I've loosened up my grip a little bit on chaos magic because originally I was a little bit rigid when it came to, um, and I think honestly this just comes from the misconception. A lot of people don't understand what chaos magic even is. And so it's really frustrating to have it constantly misrepresented. But then I have to check my ego with that and say, okay, who am I to say that someone is or is not a chaos magician if what they're doing is or is not chaos magic? At the end of the day, it shouldn't matter, right? So 
yes, I do find it slightly frustrating when Chaos Magic is constantly misunderstood, but I also have learned to not be so rigid with that title. And some of the stuff that Sanre and I had discussed in that video, I don't necessarily agree with anymore, as far as my own perspective goes. I do and I don't. Let's just say I, I feel like I see a broader perspective now and I have a lot more patience for other perspectives that differ from mine. So that was one of the biggest growing points for me. And if you're not into Chaos Magic, this whole spiel that I just went on probably makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> Ultimately, Chaos Magic is about using belief as a tool for manifestation. That's really what it boils down to. And for anybody that may be interested in Chaos Magic, I have one video that I'll link below to kind of get you started because I do have a bunch of Chaos Magic videos, but I do have one, I think it's like a five minute video that really better explains the Chaos Magic paradigm. I do have another like 12 minute video that discusses what Chaos Magic is, but I think the five minute video is a better introduction for people that have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. But let's move on to vampiric magic because that was something that really kind of changed my life and it was really helpful to my healing even on a mundane level. So I started the year by doing a collaboration with Jasmine Ambrosia. We talked about vampiric magic. I started getting into that lifestyle a little bit more because there's kind of a difference between vampiric magic and vampirism. Vampirism being the actual culture of people identifying as vampires and there, there's a whole, there's so many different subcultures underneath that category and I did actually do, oh my gosh, <laughs> here we go again. I'm gonna link tons of videos in the description box. I I say this because I know I'm gonna get comments about it. I already know that I'm gonna get a comment that says, what the hell is vampiric magic? So I'm gonna link another video in the description box. I did a whole video on what vampiric magic actually is and a lot of the rituals that I was doing. So feel free to check that out if you want to. But I started getting into vampiric magic this last year and wow, was it life-changing. For someone who is a little bit more introverted and withdrawn, somebody who has a really hard time being in public spaces, it doesn't matter how much shielding I do. It does not matter. I could do so much shielding, so much spell work to try to guard myself from other people's energy, but it doesn't matter. I'm just absorbing everyone's emotions and baggage everywhere that I go, and it's totally, utterly exhausting. So for other people that may be more empathic like me, you might want to consider, you know, picking up some of these vampiric techniques yourself because I was really able to shift my perspective on that a little bit. And instead of drawing upon people's negative energy, I was able to bring my focus to the energy of the entire room and the atmosphere and draw upon some energy to really boost my own physical energy. And I felt like this was so helpful for my chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm somebody that struggles with fatigue every single day, no matter how much sleep I get, exhausted every day. And this is something that has really, really helped me push through those really difficult days where it's hard to get out of bed. So vampiric magic, I will say helped my physical health and my emotional health and my social life really because I've been able to somewhat go out in the public a little bit more. Not a ton. I'm still kind of a hermit that never leaves my house because I love my house and it's cozy and I'm just happy here alone. <laughs> but it was still really helpful. So definitely recommend getting into vampiric magic if that's something you're interested in. But that was one paradigm shift that I jumped into not really knowing much about it. Honestly, I jumped into it because I love vampires. I mean, I was obsessed with Anne Rice, Interview with a Vampire, The Vampire Lestat, Queen of the Damned, all that stuff. Just obsessed. Not Twilight. I couldn't ever really, no shade or anything. I just, I, it wasn't my personal thing. But any sort of TV show that had vampires, I was so obsessed with that kind of stuff. So yeah, I was drawn into the vampiric lifestyle a little bit. And I've been kind of part of the vampiric lifestyle for a while, but vampiric magic specifically was just something that I started incorporating over this last year. And there's so many misconceptions about it too because people think of the standard uh, energy vampire when they think of vampirism they think of you know just the regular energy vi vampire that is sucking the life out of everyone that they're around and that sucks that sucks for the vampiric community it really does because most of the people that I've met in the vampiric community are nothing like that and that's just a really bad unfortunate stereotype so yeah I did some ego deconstruction around chaos magic I did some vampiric magic and played around with the vampire persona and then came deity work so I wanted to talk about working with the horn god. I wanted to talk about working with Thoth and then also some really interesting developments as far as just deity work in general goes. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this next bit because this last year, actually technically I think it was around December of 2022. So in January that was kind of when things were starting to go full swing with the horn god. I could be 
off with my timing, but I really worked with the Horn God a lot this last year. He was the first to present himself to me, then came Thoth at around April or May, something like that. So just for some perspective, I have been an atheist um, for a really long time, and I've been bouncing around the ideas of atheist or being agnostic or being a pantheist or whatever. I bounce around all the time, and as a chaos magician, I've been working to really deconstruct my perspectives on atheism as well, and to really get myself to believe in things that I wouldn't normally believe in. I tend to be a really like critical, overly analytical person, but I want to believe. Like it's something I really, I, I am really jealous of those people that believe so deeply in their God and their spirits and they're able to have these really transformational experiences. So over the past, I don't know, I'd say five years or so, I've been really trying to de deconstruct that part of myself and I have been really successful. So I really started deep diving into deity work this last year and the year beforehand I was working, so in 2022 I was working with Medusa. So deity work is not something that's new to me. I was also working with Ganesha before that when I was doing a little bit more of my Zen Buddhism stuff. Anyways, Horn God presented himself to me this last year and I ended up making a whole video about that too the transition of saying goodbye to Medusa and healing that part of myself and then beginning to work with the Horn God. And I really felt that the Horn God was going to tap me into my divine masculine because I've mentioned in my videos before, I feel very much uh, equal parts masculine and feminine. And so I was excited to work with the Horn God because I felt like he was gonna help me tap into that masculine side. And I really do think that he did. This was one of the years where I was able to use my deity work in my fitness routine, which was really strange. <laughs> and really odd, but I started to do workouts. It was the feeling of working with the Horn God. It was a very physical presence, whereas Thoth is a very mental presence, and I'll get to Thoth in a second, but the Horn God was so physical. Every time I was out in nature touching things, I mean during sex magic, during workouts, anything that was physical that would make me sweat, that was really just getting me into my body, it really made the connection with the Horn God that much deeper. So I feel like he helped me stay more consistent with my workouts. I mentioned in day one that I um, start, I'm starting to get back into powerlifting again, which I'm really excited because I haven't done that in like 10 years. <laughs> so I'm going all the way back to the basics, unfortunately. I can't do what my body did 10 years ago, but I'm getting there slowly. So this was a year of really just getting back into my physical body and honoring this temple or this vessel or whatever it is. In the past, I have been a person that was a little bit more detached from my physical body and almost too mental too much in my head or too up in the clouds. And so having something grounding like that to bring me back into nature, to bring me back into working out and eating good food and doing all of these physical things was really something I needed. And then Thoth came into my life around May or April, and he is hardcore. I feel like the Egyptian pantheon in general, anytime you're working with the Egyptian pantheon, it's, it seems like they are just of a different time. It's just a completely different experience than I've ever, probably some of the most moving meditations and astral trips I have ever gone on. Thoth has really been helping me with my writing. He's been, help, he's been present during um, some of the writing projects I'm doing right Right now. He's also been present when I've been doing my schoolwork, so he's very much a mental, academic, spiritual entity. That is the best way that I can explain it. But what's been a really interesting development with my whole deity work over this last year, and I do at some point want to make more dedicated videos to talk about the exact rituals that I was doing, the exact experiences I had, etc. That's way too long for this video. But I've been really almost wanting to get back into ceremonial magic because, and okay, we're, I'm going to talk about this later on. There's another video at the end of this challenge. We're going to talk about things coming up for uh, 2024 in our magical practices. So I'm not going to get too ahead of myself, but I am really interested to see where things go as far as maybe dipping my toe back into some Abrahamic beliefs. And that's wild for me to say because I know a lot of us witches or occultists, we've had a lot of trauma around Christianity and working through that trauma for me was really difficult. I never ever thought that I would ever work with the Christian God or angels ever again. I just couldn't get myself to believe in it at all. I had trauma wrapped up around it, but I think I've also fully worked through that trauma and I almost kind of want to circle back and see how that goes. So anyways, 
again, not getting ahead of myself. I will we'll talk about that in another video. But yeah, doing this deity work and even, even just working with deities as psychological archetypes, even if you don't believe that gods or goddesses exist, even just working with them as psychological archetypes and nothing more can still be just as powerful because that's how I started. I started working with them just as psychological archetypes and then the further things went along and I had more incredible experiences, more amazing meditations or astral trips or whatever, or just weird synchronicities that I couldn't quite explain, it started to open my eyes up a little bit more. And now I can really truly say that I'm no longer an atheist. And there, there have been some other meditations I've been doing as far as the threads that connect me to the collective unconscious, but that's, that's part of a writing project that I plan to share with you all, hopefully this next year. I also started connecting a lot deeper to the plants and trees and local spirits around my place. So this last year I started connecting with trees a little bit more and gnomes. And I, this is so fun. This is gonna be such a fun thing to talk about. So let me start with the gnomes, okay? So we have always been a gnome household. My partner and I are obsessed with gnomes. We love gnomes. We've always been a gnome household and I've always wanted to work with the gnomes. But again, my atheism in the past really got in the way of me ever working with any sort of fae or elementals or spirit, like house spirits or anything like that. And gnomes are just the sweetest, sweetest little spirits. Oh my goodness. I can say that now because I officially work with the gnomes and it's so exciting. So here's what I did. Around springtime, I went out to my garden and I just did a ritual on a whim. I didn't really put a lot of planning into it. I just wanted it to be fun and lighthearted. So I went out to my garden and in my garden, there's this stump and I have this, I call it my magical stump now because it's where I leave all my offerings for wildlife, for the land spirits, all of that stuff. So I left a little food offering and a little drink offering, something that it was safe, of course, for other animals to consume. I'm not gonna be leaving something out that's poisonous for the wildlife, but I left a little offering out and then I put on some fairy music. I'm not even kidding, you guys. I put on some fairy music and then I danced around my trees and my garden like a fairy. I literally just, let, there was no planning that went into this. I danced around, I sang to whatever came into me in the moment. I didn't wanna plan anything. There was no official invocation or evocation or whatever. I basically just out loud invited the gnomes to my garden space and I said gnomes if you would like to come into my space and work with me this year on my garden you are more than welcome here are some offerings take what you want you know that type of thing and I didn't even know if anything would come of it and then and then I started having crazy spiritual activity around my garden. I have never had this kind of spiritual activity around my garden. It was weird. Okay, first of all, there were multiple instances where I would come out in the evenings and it would be kind of dark, you know, it's dusk or whatever, and I'm walking around. I like to do that. In the evenings, I like to walk around my yard and see all the yard work I've done and say hello to my plants and whatever. I swear out of the corner of my eye that I saw gnomes standing in the walkways of my garden beds because I have these um, really large garden beds that are built out of concrete blocks and there's about a two foot space in between all the garden beds and so I swore that there were gnomes in between the garden beds I would just see a little a little shift of movement in between the gardens out of the corner of my eye but then I thought to myself you know because I'm a very skeptical person I was like okay that's that's just in my head I just want there to be gnomes so bad that my brain is playing tricks on me there's not really anything there even though I want it to be there so badly I have to be realistic so those are the thoughts in my head and I was thinking that there were absolutely no gnomes whatsoever. And then I shared this in one of my other videos too. We had left for Greece over this summer and really everything should have died in our garden because we were gone for over two weeks. I think it was almost three actually and it was hot. I mean scorching hot. We didn't get anybody to water our garden when we were gone because we couldn't find anybody and I was really sad because I just thought my garden was gonna die. I was like two weeks of absolutely no water and scorching heat. Everything's gonna be dead when we come back. And we came back from our trip, everything was flourishing. I don't understand how that's possible because we got very, very little rain. Everything absolutely should have died. In previous years, it would have died, but somehow the garden kept going. And you know what's even weirder is that everything outside of the garden was dead. Everything was dead because of how hot it was, but the garden, flourishing and green. And I absolutely believe to my core that the gnomes were taking care of the garden while we were gone. Don't ask me how, I don't know. And there was also an empty spot in the garden where I hadn't planted anything because I forgot and it was too late and whatever. All of a sudden something started sprouting in that area of my garden. And I thought that's odd. I did not plant anything there. All of a 
sudden, pumpkins started to grow out of a random patch in my garden where I planted nothing. And before you say anything, I know exactly what's in my soil. We have a very meticulous system when it comes to our soil and our compost, so I know for sure that there were no pumpkin seeds. I have not planted any. We don't eat pumpkin in this household, so there are no pumpkins that could ever actually go into the compost bin and then be recycled. So there was no way that we had accidentally put these pumpkin seeds in the garden. And on top of that, we have I don't know, like eight foot tall fences all the way around our property. There's no way that something else could have been planted. I suppose there is a small possibility that birds could have taken pumpkin seeds from someone else's garden or squirrels maybe, and then they could have taken it and buried it in our garden. That is a possibility that I thought about as well. But none of our neighbors have gardens for one. And two, the amount of pumpkin seeds. It wasn't just like one or two or five plants. It was like 20 to 30 pumpkin plants that I had to go in and actually weed some of them out because they were just gonna kill each other off. There wasn't enough space for that many pumpkin plants to be growing. So I don't understand where all of these pumpkin seeds came from, it was wild. Anyway, so I took that as, this is a little gift from the gnomes and I thought it was so cute and sweet. I don't care what anybody else thinks, okay? The gnomes did it for me and the fact that my garden and flourished even when I was gone. That was just really cool. So I brought some of the pumpkins inside. You probably saw that if you watched my vlog. Um, you saw that the pumpkins actually came inside and served as part of my um, decor during Halloween and Samhain. So I definitely am having a good relationship with the gnomes right now and then I'm gonna leave out offerings and probably do another ritual next spring when it's time to go again and I'll do another, I don't know, a little fairy dance or something. So that's my update on the gnomes, but I've also gotten a lot closer to tree spirits this last year. I've always had a fascination and love for trees but this year I really did not only just deepen my relationship with specific like plants and herbs that I'm working with but trees specifically and working like with dryad spirits inside old old trees and just doing a lot of meditations and a lot of astral work with different trees having tree tasting ceremonies and things like that I did also do a video that was a deep dive on tree magic so I'll link that um, in the description box but yeah tree magic uh, it was something that was really integral to my my paganism this year not just my witchcraft but really my paganism because it just connected me to nature in a way that I didn't even realize I needed I needed that so badly so I've been building relationships with the trees in my backyard I have a tiny teeny tiny little grove it's not even really a grove it's just like five trees or something I don't know but I've been trying to get better at um, being able to identify trees using fallen branches in decor or as incense or, you know things like that and then I paradigm shifted again into folk magic <laughs> folk magic is having its moment right now it definitely is having its moment in the community everybody's talking about folk magic I've interviewed a couple folk practitioners on this channel I think I've interviewed three something like that I think three or four something and I do have some other folk practitioners from other cultures and other regions that I'm going to be interviewing next year and because I also traveled to Greece this summer I was really able to immerse myself in the folk traditions of that area because where we stayed was not a touristy area at all we really stayed kind of where the locals were because we went there for uh, my brother-in-law's wedding he was getting married to a woman that is Greek so we spent a lot of time with her family and other Greek families and I really feel like I got such a wonderful introduction to the culture as far as food and spirituality and language and all of that kind of stuff. So anyways, deep diving into folk magic or paradigm shifting into that, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself a folk practitioner because that's not primarily what I do. I just found it really interesting as a chaos magician to paradigm shift into folk magic briefly to see what it's like to learn the different cultures and customs and rituals and traditions and ingredients that vary from region to region because you could talk to somebody even just in the United United States. You can talk to somebody from the West Coast and then talk to somebody from the East Coast and those two people are going to have very different traditions when it comes to healing rituals or protection charms or even some of the folklore that relates to their region and what kind of plants are growing around them. What can they use in their spell work that relates to the wildlife that's there? So I find that fascinating just from a historical perspective. So even though I wouldn't call myself a folk practitioner, I find it really fascinating to learn about because I want to understand understand different cultures as
as much as possible. I feel like we're able to respect each other so much more when we understand each other. And so if someone wants to share their culture with me and if somebody wants to talk to me and share, you know, what kind of charms they're doing, oh, I just love that kind of stuff. The last paradigm shift that I really went through this last year was through necromancy. Um, so I had read The Bones Fall in a Spiral by Mortellus. Fantastic book. I highly recommend it. I also interviewed Mortellus on the channel. Reading that book really had me realize that I was doing necromancy without even realizing that I was doing it. I was already working with spirits, working with the dead, working with my ancestors, channeling messages and those types of things, but I had never considered it as a form of necromancy or even called myself a necromancer by any means. So reading that book was really a huge shift for me because not only was it really accessible, but I was able to expand upon my own rituals with that. I started giving blood offerings a little bit more and I, that's such a controversial subject. I may actually do a video uh, for blood magic, the do's and the don'ts. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely comment it below. I've kind of debated whether I want to talk about blood magic on this channel because it's so controversial and I don't want to get shut down by YouTube or have to deal with people in the comments who don't understand what it is that I'm actually doing. But if that's something you're interested in, definitely let me know. But working with the dead and kind of going to the underworld in my own meditations and reflecting on my relationship with death. I I've always been someone that's thought about death pretty much every single day from the moment I can even remember existing. Death is such an important part of my practice, honoring the dead, thinking about death and what even happens in the next life, if there is even anything that happens in the next life, and really kind of evaluating my pantheist, atheist, agnostic, uh, polytheist perspective on the world, really developing what it is that I personally believe to be true, which is nothing because nothing is true and everything is permitted. If you know, you know. But yeah, I would say that my relationship with the dead, with the other world was definitely deepened, especially over the past three months, I would say, because again, this is stuff that I was already doing in my practice, but it really had me contemplating that a little bit deeper after reading that necromancy book. And then of course I did a lot of other stuff throughout the year. I mean, lots of little things, but I would say the biggest contributors for this year were reducing rigidity when it comes to my perspective on chaos magic, going through that vampiric magic paradigm shift, all the deity work, Work that I did and kind of the deconstructing I had in my mind about atheism, working with the gnomes and the trees, deepening my connection to different plants, and then of course deepening my relationship with death and necromancy. Later in this week I can't wait to share what's coming up next, but thank you for allowing me to reflect. If you're still watching this video up until this point, thank you so much for caring and I'll see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.